we're going to be looking at the legal perspective of seafarers rights we're also going to be considering um, other international perspectives as well and the nigerian perspective so to lead the conversation today on the legal perspective we'll be having a person of she Kenneth Chijoke Keme, who is an associate of Farmsville. Um, Farmsville is the body that is um, organizing this amazing webinar. So thank you, Farmsville, for this. Um, thank you, Elini. So Elini is um, a lawyer, international lawyer with experience, and she works with as a claims officer with um going to be talking to us. Um, the international perspective as a person that has worked with the International Maritime Agent um, Organization and also the PNI Claims and Club, so um, Standard Club. All right, so thank you, Eleni. Over to you. Thank you very much, Madura. Uh, sorry, your name, Maduraji. No. Great. I'm afraid the, the connection is not great. But uh, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Elena Antoniadu. I work as um, a claims executive for the standard PNI club. Uh, if anyone has questions, you can either wait at the end of the presentation or you can just drop it in the chat box. So I work for the standard club uh, as a claims executive for the offshore division for the last year. But before that, I was working as a legal officer at the International Maritime Organization in London. And before this position, I was the policy and regulatory affairs advisor for the International Marine Contractors Association, IMCA. So I'm coming from a legal background. I'm a lawyer specializing in shipping and the energy facilities. So First of all, I would like to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to introduce you to the club uh, and also to discuss about such an important issue as is the crew welfare and the well-being, uh, especially today, which is the International Day of the Seafarers. So I'm very happy, excited and proud to be here and give you this presentation. So... Um, going to the second slide, if I'm, I'm going to manage to do that. Sorry for that. Okay. So uh, just a bit of, uh, just to present you the club, the constant feedback that we receive from our members, the ship owners, is that although there are other 12 PNI clubs in the world, we are 13 in total, what makes us different is the special personal uh, relationships that we build with each member. So this is what distinguishes us from our competitors. Uh, in addition, uh, just a bit of the background of who we are. We are a specialist marine and energy insurer. We cover all the major shipping markets and we have offices worldwide for, I am based in London, but we have also an office in Piraeus, in Greece, in New York, uh, in Bermuda, uh, in Asia, in Tokyo, and so in Singapore, and so on and so forth. So we try to uh, operate in different time zones just to give responses to emergencies to our members at any time, 24-7. Uh, also, we take pride of the quality of our membership. So all the ship owners that we uh, ensure they comply with all the international regulations. And of course, we uh, run a risk management analysis before we decide to insure them. So moving on on our services, uh, we have three major areas, the underwriting, uh, this is an area where our underwriters try to uh, produce tailor-made solutions of insurance covers for the members. Uh, and also we provide additional covers, for instance, if there is a risk of delay, of strikes, risks, etc. So those are additional services that we provide as an insurance company. Uh, also, we have a very strong team of technical experts. We have 
um, marine um, architects and former mariners who are there in order to assess the risk of the operations of the members and very often to provide solutions when there are um, issues which require immediate action. So for instance, I just want to share some of my personal experience uh, while I give you examples when I talk about something. So last week I had the emergency phone of the club. So I received a call on a Sunday morning about a cargo damage claim in Australia. So the member, I'm not going to mention names, of course, it's anonymized, but the member had an issue because the cargo was damaged. Uh, there was a leakage in the ship. So they called me, I called our technical expert, and we were trying to find a way to dispose the cargo uh, because the initial thought was to dispose it at the sea. But since we are in Australia and AMSA is a strict regulator, and as we know, based on IMO regulations, this is, not, this is a prohibited action, we found a way very quickly on Sunday to dispose the damaged cargo on land in Australia in order to avoid any unnecessary delays. So this is one additional value. This is where we can help our members in order to avoid delays and save costs. And of course, uh, this is my area. We have a 24-7 response when it comes to uh, claims handling. So today I'm going to speak. I know that I have 15 minutes or so. Uh, I will give you an overview about the PNI cover, what we mean by PNI cover. Perhaps most of you are familiar with uh, the area that I'm going to present to you, crew claims. And if we have time, we're going to have uh, some quick discussion about human behaviors, well-being, and safety. Um, this is not supposed to show like that but it's fine. So let me, yeah, I'll we'll have those technical difficulties. So um, I'm going to share the slides after the presentation for everyone's benefit. This is not a problem, uh, but just to give you some background, when we talk about p &I insurance, we discuss about insurance which responds to third-party liabilities arising from carriage of cargo, or personnel. Uh, this type of insurance, the p &I insurance, is provided by only 13 clubs worldwide. And we uh, insure, actually those 13 clubs insure 90% of the world's ocean going tonnage. So actually it's almost the entirety of the shipping industry. So this is a mechanism in order to share risk. So all the members of those 13 clubs have a common, uh, let's say, uh, pull a, a pot of money. And if there are there is a covered risk, then the clubs are going to compensate each member separately based on the rules and the mutuality uh, concept that we have. So this is a shared uh, insurance program. And we have, of course, reinsurance, uh, which uh, there is a cover limit there approximately to $8 billion. So moving on, and my apologies again, because you cannot see the slides, I think, but I will share them after the presentation. We are, as I said, 13 PNI clubs in the world. Uh, other, other peers include uh, Guard, of course, the Norwegian uh, insurance company, Sky, the Swedish club, Britannia, uh, and others. Um, let me see. I don't know if uh, the moderator has my slides and perhaps you can share it as I talk and perhaps the quality better. Because right now it's, it's not very helpful. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, I can hear you. Um can you make me an admin again so that I can see how I can get that done while you're going ahead? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Apologies for that. This is just a technical issue. Yeah. Anyway, I'm yeah. gonna 
I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna continue. So everyone can use their their laptop. Very very useful. Okay. Have you made me an administrator? Um, just a second, because I'm afraid my laptop. Okay. All right. Let me see. How can I make an administrator? Okay, just click on my name. Look for me on the participant section. Then click on my name. And then you see an option. Just say make host. Make host. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. You can go ahead. I'll, I'll work on getting your slide up. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. So I'm going to continue with my presentation. And then at some point, you can have the ability to see the slides. But in any case, we will share them after the presentation. So moving on, uh, the PNI mutual cover uh, covers risks such as personal injury of seafarers, uh, the death of a seafarer during the course of his her employment, illness, uh, and I'm sure everyone is interested in our response regarding COVID-19. I'm going to go there. Uh, cargo. Uh, shortages or damages, this is another risk that we cover. Pollution, incidents, oil spills, etc. Collision, contact damage, wreck removal, and fines. So those are all categories of risks that the PNI cover is here to cover. So, uh, of course, for uh, the attendees who are interested in the offshore uh, sector, oil and gas and renewables uh, sector. So for this type of claims, uh, we still cover them from the pool of money that I mentioned earlier, but we need to review first the contract between the contractor and the oil and, oil and gas company in order to make sure that it is drafted on knock for knock um, terms. That means that each party undertakes the risk for its property and its personnel. Only if it's on knock-for-knock -knock, uh, terms, this is when we're gonna cover. So when it comes to crew claims, sorry for, again, my apologies for the, pure qual the poor quality of my slides. But yeah, when it comes to crew claims, um, the PNI cover includes the costs of repatriation of the seafarers, uh, crew substitution, loss of personal effects, and also we instruct if there is any um, need, we will instruct a local correspondent in order to coordinate our response to a claim. So just to give you an example, when it comes to COVID-19, we cover all the expenses regarding, uh, you know, illness or death of a seafarer due to a COVID-19. It is exactly the same position that we take when there is any other type of sickness, illness on board, uh, but it needs to be during the course of the employment of the seafarer in order to be covered. However, depending on the contract, on the employment contract, we may cover illness expenses of the crew member who contracted the coronavirus when he left the ship. So he was still in the course of his employment. Um, however, he didn't contract the COVID-19 on board, but he did on the shore. So this is a very important um, element because some crew contracts cover a crew member only if he has contracted uh, the virus on board. But we are going to, in each case, so in a recent example that I had, there was a seafarer who left the ship. 
he disembarked in Rio, and then he was stranded there in Brazil because he couldn't find a flight to be repatriated. So he was stuck in Rio for a month. He was still in the course of employment, so his contract of employment hadn't expired. And he was trying to go back to Europe because he was from Europe. However, unfortunately, he contracted COVID-19 after a month in Rio, and his contract of employment said that he can get compensation only if he contracted, if he fell ill on board the ship. However, what we did was that our legal team reviewed the contract of employment. We found that the contract of employment is governed by Singaporean law, and since Singapore has ratified the MLC, and the MLC uh, obliges the owner to cover the seafarer while he's in his course of employment, either on board or on the shore, then we concluded that the ship owner has a legal obligation to cover those expenses, even if uh, the coronavirus was contracted on shore, and then we're going to cover those expenses, which actually are quite high because this particular seafarer is on a ventilator right now. Um, I don't know, he entered the ICU six weeks ago, so the costs already are, are really, really high, and we, we are going to cover those. So you understand uh, how important it is to know the apply the governing law of a, of a crew contract and understand exactly the particular jurisdiction because something, a risk may not be covered there, but it may be covered by the applicable law. So um, let's move on to the next slide that you cannot see, but I'm going to explain this to you. So we cover the owner's liabilities regarding injury illness and death arising from negligence, statutory obligation, as we mentioned, the MLC, or under an approved crew contract, if the crew contract says so. So common injuries that we have noticed uh, for the seafarers is disc herniation, uh, contusion, burns, crashing injuries, uh, traumatic amputation, eye injury, sprain. So there is a series of common injuries that we have seen when we receive our uh, claims notification. And common illnesses are such as gastritis, hemorrhoids, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes. So again, there is a common pattern of diseases, uh, injuries, and sicknesses that we see uh, based on our data of the claims. So what we encourage our members to do when they have a crew claim is to inspect the location and the equipment together with the club surveyor or our local PNI correspondent. This is very important. It is very important also to take photographs of the place if there has been an accident. This is all evidence that we may use moving on if we want to um, succeed for a settlement or litigation. So it's very important to have evidence. Uh, record the time, of course, and the date of the photographs, and then just try to maintain all this evidence, uh, the incident reports, and so on and so forth. Uh, in addition, if medical attention is required, it's very important to keep all the records of the medical treatment on board in order then to ask for a reimbursement for us. So those are things that we, you need to do even if the situation is quite, you know, overwhelming, even if the accident is very, very uh, difficult. So I'm going to give you another example from a recent claim that we had. Uh, again, it's in Rio, it's COVID-19 related, and we have notified that a vessel that we ensure uh, there are 55 positive tested uh, crew members on board. 
So you can imagine how much evidence you have to collect in order to show later on what the ship owner did, all the medical expenses, uh, how what steps they took in order to contain the virus. Uh, so this is something that we try now to assess and also see exactly the exposure and the potential expenses that the member will incur. And of course, we will reimburse later on. So um, I'm not, I can see that my time is running out. So I think I'm going to give the, the floor to the next presenter to discuss about the well being and safety of the crew. Uh, the most important thing that I would like to say before I conclude is that when it comes to a seafarer incident, the, the most important mantra that we have as a club is that every person counts. Of course, there is the monetary value. No one can deny that. But something such as the loss of life or a serious injury, a disability, permanent disability, this is the most important uh, thing for us. That's why we try to liaise with the family, the relatives, and try to find a solution together to see how we can offer the best treatment, uh, the best medical attention that we can. Um, so this is the most important because that affects also the reputation of our members, how they treat their employees. Um, so also what I would like to say is that it is astonishing uh, to see the rates of seafarer suicide. Uh, so this is a taboo. No one talks very frequently about that, about the mental health of seafarers. But this is an important area that, you know, as a club, if you want to go to our website, the website of the Standard Club, you can see that we have issued some materials, some articles about it and bulletins in order to address this very, very, very important issue of mental health. Um, so we acknowledge that anxiety, stress, depression uh, may affect not only the mental health uh, of the seafarers, but also the safety on board. Because if a seafarer is distracted due to all the emotional strains, of course, this may affect the safety of the ship. Uh, we had also an incident where, I, again, I'm not going to mention names, but uh, there were some seafarers who wanted to have a social interaction on board. It was a Sunday. They wanted to have a barbecue on the ship, which is totally acceptable and understandable. However, there is a zero alcohol policy. Uh, so there is no alcohol, alcohol uh, permitted on board. And unfortunately, some of the seafarers, I'm not going to say that everyone is going to do that, but some of them went to the engine room and they consumed a bottle of some, ta some type of toxic. So that was not something to drink. Of course, there was alcohol there, uh, but they did it, I guess, because they were facing some psychological difficulties. I don't know. The problem is that one of them, I think, died. Someone else lost his vision. And, of course, this is something that we really, really, really want, don't want to see that again. But also it's something that it's important to discuss it, be transparent, and, and try to find a way to prevent it, you know, uh, for the future. So I'm going to just uh, put a full stop here because I can see that my time is up. Uh, if you want any, if you have any question about what we do, how we can help, please drop me an email, a line. Uh, in my slides, I have included my contact details. And of course, if you have any question right now or afterwards, please address it. Uh, again, my apologies for the technical difficulty regarding my slides. Uh, but let me know if I can help you uh, in any other fashion. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you very much. Your session was very, very, very enlightening. Um, very key points to note there. Um, please, if we have questions, um, let's put them in the chat box and we are going to make sure we address them um, immediately after all the speakers are done. Um, I also want to um, note that um, we already have some questions ready, which we will share um, after the sessions. Also, um, we will share any slides with everyone. We'll send it to your emails so that you can digest them and her contact details are there. I've also enabled um, all the speakers to be able to share their screens. So Akash, you, you can share yours as soon as you come up. So, Akash will be coming up um, to talk to us next. He is the founder of ShipScope. And he's going to be sharing the international perspective of what he has to share. So. Hi, guys. Can you hear me all? Need a confirmation from you guys. Yes, we can. It's good. Perfect, 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 perfect. Hi, guys. My name is Akash, and uh, I am. Yes, we can. Of we can see you. Yeah. 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 I am a fellow seafarer as well. I've been sailing for a couple of years in shipping. I did my master's from UK. Now I just founded Shipsco. So as we progress, I'll keep on letting you my insights, how things are. And today's key topic is seafarers are the key workers. So in today's presentation, the one which I made right now, I'll be sharing three things. I'll be just giving you a brief introduction, and then I'll be getting into what are the challenges which are faced by the maritime industry at the moment, okay? And how seafarers play an important role. Shipping itself is a niche industry, guys. I mean, most of the people who have joined us today are in different segments of the industry, right? And even though it's being shipping is niche, it, consist, it constitutes of 90% of the whole world trade which happens. You know? In the shipping itself, there are different segments, like some might be from p &I, claims, some might be from commercial, some might be from seafaring background, some might be from shipping finance. So there are a lot of different divisions in that small industry itself, which itself gives endless possibilities, right? One of the major problems which is mainly faced by the industry right now is the shortage of manpower. That means the total number of people who are applying with respect to sea and shore, right? As per, there was this one survey which was conducted by Man, Manpower Group, which says 40,000, 45% is needed, guys. And that was the need of the hour. Coming back to the whole thing, what are the challenges which are faced by the industry with respect to seafarers? So I've come up with some different points. And the way I'm going to explain it, guys, I'll put some points for you. And I'll try to give my own instances, my own life examples. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. The first one, addressing some of the unattractive aspects of the job. What are these exactly? First one is the repatriation cost, guys. Now we know because of this COVID-19 situation, most of the seafarers are already stuck, stuck on the ship and their contracts have expired. And me being a seafarer, it's Self, I know guys what kind of physical and mental pain people actually go through these things. And especially when you have already finished your contract and you're overextended your contract and on top of it, you're not able to go to your own home country because the flights are completely off, the governments are not letting people in. That is where the a big issue comes into play. So that is the core thing right now. So people are really trying, the ship owners, all the shipping organizations are trying their level best to make sure the existing uh, sailors are home and they are replaced by fresh crew, right? The second one is the connectivity. Now, when I was a seafarer, the biggest problem when it comes down to connectivity is most of the ships don't have internet. So I sailed on a couple of ships where we didn't have any internet connection. All I could get was um, I used to go to I used to go to shore. I used to ask surveyors to bring some cards which have internet connection on board. That is how we used to be in touch with our loved ones when we were home. And there is also provision of entertainment. It's a bit difficult. And especially we are able to call our loved ones with the help of satellite phone, but that might be a bit expensive, depending upon the kind of equipment setup which you have on ship. Potential criminalization. Now, accidents do happen on board. At times, whenever a big issue happens, seafarers are considered to be a criminals and they are, you know, put behind the bar. So that is what, again, one issue is there. Maritime piracy. Now, piracy is a delicate topic because there are certain regions throughout the world which they are focusing upon. 
So especially if you see Malacca Straits, Gulf of Aden, Gulf of uh, Guinea, these are the places where there is a huge amount of piracy activity happening. And the core point which I really want to focus here is, guys, it all comes down to media as well, because the media, how it lights up the whole public. Many youngsters who want to even get into seafaring background do think tw twice, you know, because of these activities which are taking place up. Finally, it's the work and fire family balance. Now, we all are professionals. We have two aspects of our life. One is the personal level and one is the professional level. So if the key to happiness is if you are able to juggle and if you are able to find that really exact uh, equilibrium between the two worlds, right? Now, as far as the seafarers are concerned, they leave their personal things behind and they come on board for like six to seven, eight, nine months, depending upon the type of contract which they are signing up. So, as I say, guys, I mean, it's it's a huge commitment from a person who is sitting home. They might be wife, they might be son, they might be brothers, parents. So they have to take care a lot. While this person who is the only earning member who is coming on board and working. Uh, bringing more women into talent pool. Uh, so according to the recent ITF figures, total amount of seafarers are around roughly around 1 million, out of which only 2% are seafarers. That is what the whole women are there in seafaring background. And I would even, uh, I won't speak much on this topic because I will, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Miss Admaka is also going to be, she is a seafarer as well. She will be telling us a lot about this topic in depth. So I'll just go ahead, guys. The long-term threat of the automated ship. Now, automated ships itself are going to take some amount of time. But what I really mean of automated is, if you see, guys, in the last, and I mean, in the last era, 40, 50 years back, we had roughly around 40, 50 people running a ship. But now, a normal ship can be run by just by 20 to 25 people, maybe less. So, from a ship owner's behalf, they are trying to cut the cost by reducing the crew crew size and bringing the automation into the ship. The more you make machinery automated, the lesser people you need. So that is where, again, it's a big challenge. And uh, building the capacity of existing crew to learn the new digital environment. Now we are heading into a digital era. There are people who are already on board. There are a lot of things which our which ship owners are trying to make it more feasible with the help of digital technology. Now we need to also help people who are on board to get accustomed to this digital environment. This itself is a big challenge too. And the last one is the attraction, attracting Generation Z to the exciting world of shipping. As I gave you the stats in my number one slide, guys, you know there is a short shortage of people in both offshore and onshore industry. Now how I am trying to address this issue with the help of ShipSpo. Now, what I'm trying to do is I have come up with an online platform in which I am enlightening public about what commercial shipping is all about. It is helping the younger generation to know what shipping is from inside. So once they step in tomorrow, they know what they have to do. And secondly, it's also helping the professionals who are there in the industry. Now, since you know that there are different segments in the industry, even if you want to know something or if you want to switch a career path, you can always do that with the help of these lectures. So I'm trying to come up with 20, 20 minutes success and presentation in which I'm trying to combine my experience and my knowledge into one platform, which is ShipScope, guys. So I won't talk much about it. But now let's focus upon seafarers. Why seafarers are being important? I'll give you 10 reasons for it. And yeah, the first one is they actually run the whole global economy, guys. They are the ones who are behind the ships. We have people there. Seafarers are sacrificing their social life. As I say, guys, I mean, I was a seafarer. I came on board for like, when I used to go on ships, I used to be there for five to six months minimum, depending upon the contract which you sign. That amount, they are missing on their personal life. Guys. Because if you don't give internet, if you don't have internet, and if you don't have any medium to contact what is happening home, they are, they are just there. So they are sacrificing their social life, guys, comparatively to the others. Seafarers fight the toughest seas and roughest feathers. Yeah. So about this thing, uh, it depends upon, um, there are many locations where you get very bad weather, such as I've been sailing through, I've, I've, I've sailed in South China Sea, Bay of Biscay, coast via Atlantic. These are all places when you start getting a rough weather, it becomes really bad. You can expect a roll. Roll means a ship which actually, if this is ship, it just goes like this. this, this. You can be around 30 degrees roll you have to face for a couple of hours, couple of days, depending upon where you're sailing. 
So yeah, they have to be mentally and physically tough at the end of the day. Seafarer risks their lives through piracy and war zones. I've already covered this topic, guys. The most hazardous ship, as per me, is the Type One chemical tanker. I've sailed on chemical tankers too, and especially when you're going through the cargo operation, you have to wear proper PPE, which is personal protect- protective equipment. So you have to care for your life because life matters most. So you have the seafarers are going through extreme environments. Eh? Seafarer followed a tough regulations and laws. This was really best explained by uh, Miss Eleni. Before this, I won't dig into it. Seafarers work round the clock with monotonous routine. Now I'm a seafarer. I was a seafarer, and uh, I'll give you an instance. So I was in, I was sailing on tankers, and especially on tankers, we have something called a six on six off, which means six hours of work, six hours of sleep, and especially when you're discharging or loading a liquid cargo, which is oil, you have to be careful with that. On top of your cargo operations, there are various operations which do come into play, such as there are stores coming in. You have to land people down. Repatriation might be there. Taking fresh water, uh, then getting rid of the garbage, taking stores in, bunkering operation. These all efforts require additional manpower on ship. With respect to the people who are working, so the real job comes in when you have to wake up the crew for extra work because you are actually breaking the sleep hours. So we have to work around the clock when you are on board, and nobody complains, guys. Nobody complains because they know work is essential. Seafarers work the most without the basic rights, as I keep on saying, guys. They just work there. Seafarers are high risk of criminalization and abandonment while they are performing their duties. As as you know, guys, it's a very specialized job, and even if a small thing goes down, if there is a chain, there there can be mishaps, big mishaps, which can happen on board. And that itself is very very dangerous situation. So we have to be careful what we do. Seafarers live with least accommodation and communication facilities. As far as the communication, I've already told you guys about the connectivity and all. Accommodation. When I when when I mean when I go on board, there is one small cabin which is going to which is going to which is given to me, and that's going to be my home for like next six to seven months, depending again. So. Again, guys. I mean, you have to stay there. You have to make sure your hygiene is there. Everything is taken by seafarers itself. Uh, I won't. I mean, just to end this whole presentation, I would like to, you know, quote this quote, which was said by Kitak Lim. He is the Secretary General of IMO. He says, "Just like other key workers, seafarers are on the front line in the global fight. They deserve our thanks, but they also need and deserve quick and decisive." humanitarian actions from the governments everywhere not just during the pandemic but at all times guys yeah seafarers are the key key chain in the whole link of the shipping industry with this i finish off my lecture guys and again i will be sharing all of my slides with you guys if you have any questions you can get up but get back to me i'll put my contact details on the slides and feel free to have a talk, get me get in touch guys thank you Thank you very much, Akash. That was a very informative session. Um, I think I, I uh, you know, I became more enlightened about the plight of seafarers just considering your own experiences and um, what you've been through and um, people you've had to work with on 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 such um voyage. Thank you very much for that. Um, questions are coming in. We have some yeah. remaining. So um, we'll take that after everyone. I'm sure if you have any question f- and questions for Akash, um, feel free to um, drop them in the chat box, and we will read it to him so that he can answer at the end of the session. Is that okay, Akash? So we're going to read your questions. Cheers, guys. All right, thank you. So up next, without further ado, let's welcome um, Kenneth Chijoki Keme. He is um, associate of Farms View. And he will be sharing with us the legal perspective of seafarers, their rights, both internationally and um, um, locally, from the Nigerian perspective. Over to you, Kenneth. Right. Thank you very much, Bolaji. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good morning, rather, Nigeria, and good afternoon <clears throat> to others in other parts of the world. As I've been introduced, my name is Kenneth. I'm an associate at Farmzoo Solicitors. Um, so I'll just be tying in some of the key points that Eleni and Akash have mentioned. Um, as Bolaji has mentioned, I'll be talking about um, the legal rights um, as they affect seafarers. So I'll just be sharing my sli- my screen. Um, just give me a moment, please. Okay, so seafarers are key workers. So I'm just talking about a legal perspective. 
So I'll be looking at it from um, five different areas. I'll be looking at um, the flag state law. I'll look at it from the perspective of flag state law. Um, so this really has to do with um, a state that, or a vessel that flies the flag of, of a state. So what are the protections that a seafarer has? Or does a seafarer have protections from this, um, from states that fly vessels? So the, Tur the flag I'm using here is the Turkish flag. So um, the answer is yes. A seafarer has rights and protections that he gets um, when he works for works on board a vessel that flies this, um, the the flag of a particular country. So, for example, I used the Turkish flag. So, if, for example, someone that's a Nigerian national works <clears throat> on board a vessel that flies um, the Turkish flag, some of the rights or protections that he he um, he has is for repatriation. So some of the issues that um, Akash and Eleni mentioned, um, or particularly Akash, has to do with repatriation, which is one of the issues many seafarers face. For example, um, you live in your home country um, to work in a different um, jurisdiction, flying the flag of a different state. When you leave your country, sometimes the rights that you have, one of the rights that a seafarer has that emanates from the flag state that he works for is to um, to be repatriated to his, to his country. Um, one also um, right which a seafarer has is um, safety at sea. So, and this has to do with the UNCLOS, that's the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. So, a seafarer has the right to be, um, to be kept safe um, as long as he works for... Um, a, um, a country that has that flies a particular flag. So the next one I'll be talking about will be port state law. So what can the port states do? When I talk about the port state law here, what I refer to here is that when vessels leave one particular jurisdiction and they go to a different country, there's a place where they birth and they birth at the port of a different country. So there's an element of control that um, that state because. How it works in international law is that when you're in the when you're in the territorial waters of a country, you are within its jurisdiction. So there, there are certain rights that accrue to you as a seafarer, even when you're there. So um, one of the things which I also mentioned also that is very um very, very particular is repatriation. So if there's going to be an issue where you are abandoned in a different country, as long as you're within the jurisdiction of a different country or the port states, one of the um, things you are um which one of the benefits you can get is you can be repatriated um, by um, by a ship owner to your own country, and and also one of that aspect as well is the social protection of seafarers, and this is guaranteed by the Maritime Labor Convention of 2006. Um, many countries in the world have acceded um, to this um, convention. In Nigeria, for example, it has also been they've also assented to it as well. So there's a case in note which I also want to point out. Um, sometime two years ago. About 30, one seafarers were abandoned in at the UAE as, and as a port state, the UAE was reminded of its obligations. So what this simply means now is that the obligations of the state is to ensure that the seafarers are repatriated to their home country. So when you had this case um, of 31 seafarers that were abandoned, which is one of the issues that that plague seafarers. The port state had to be reminded, and most times the um, responsibility of repatriation is actually first borne by the ship owner. And then, if that's not, um, if the ship owner refuses to do that or can't do that, then it is borne by the flag state. And if the flag state is unable to do that, and then the country where you're a national from, so for example, if you're from India and you uh, were abandoned in Spain, for example, so the ship owner you work for. Is supposed to repatriate you, and if that doesn't if that doesn't work out, then the port state has to repatriate you. So one thing I want to point out now is that the flag state can be different from the port state. So the port, so the flag state of the of the vessel could be say, could be French, and then the port state could be Spanish. So now the question now is who's supposed to repatriate you? So there's there's like a um, there's like an order of who should repatriate you. So it starts with the ship owner first, and if the ship owner is not able to do that, then it falls with the port state. If the port state is not able to do that, then it falls um, to your own country. So when that issue arises, I think it's very important to contact the consular services or the um, the high commission of your country where you've been abandoned. So the next aspect is local law on the municipal law. So I'll be from this. I'll be sharing this in terms of the Nigerian perspective. So what laws guarantee protection? Um, 
And I think this applies to um, every seafarer all around the world. So one of the th- one of the laws that will obviously govern um, issues um, with regards to your rights will be your local con- your constitution, the constitution of, of your country, or the laws or cases that have been or acts that have been enacted by your parliament or national assembly. So what sort of rights can be protected under local laws? These rights that can be protected under local laws can also be protected under international law. So in Nigeria, as a seafarer, we've talked about the working conditions, we've talked about basic rights, we've talked about suicide and mental health. So the duty of the ship owner um, that he owes to the um, seafarers is that he has to ensure that his rights is protected, uh, his dignity of person as well, and personal liberty, rights to wages, because seafarers don't work for free. Um, seafarers go on board vessel, they travel from country to country, and they have to be paid for that. So that's one of the rights that seafarers have locally and internationally, rights to wages, and then medical care as well. And then one very key aspect that I would like to mention is the contract of employment. So how important is the contract of employment? The contract of employment is very important because it shows the rights and obligations of the employer, who is the ship owner in this case, and then the seafarer. So there, there are situations where you have a managing agent that um, works for a ship owner and then recruits a seafarer to work for a ship owner. So you need to understand what the rights are for the seafarer. For example, who you sign a contract with. Um, in situations where you have an agent, you sign an agreement with an agent or the contract with an agent, you need to know who your employer is. Are you working as an agent or are you working as are you working as an employer rather? Or are you working as an agent of of the um, of the managing agent? So these are things you one needs to consider when you're looking at your contract of employment. And um, collective bargaining agreements as well, in terms of um, you when you have unions and regulatory bodies that have come together to sign agreements um, in terms of how they can protect the rights of seafarers. So recently, NEMASA signed um, a collective bargain, bargaining agreement last year with um, certain unions in Nigeria, the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria, and other unions as well. So they set the standard of compliance to ensure that seafarers are protected. So if you're a seafarer, and when you're looking at your contract of employment um, between that you signed with your ship owner, you also need to take into consideration what the collective bargaining agreement says as well to ensure that when there's any issue of of, um, of dismissal or being asked to leave your workplace, that the right procedure is actually being followed. Um, then the next thing is what should you take note of? Um, some of the things you need to take note of in your contract is the duration of your contract. So there was a case um, recently where um, a Bangladeshi seafarer was actually... Um, supposed to work in, he was made to work for one year, which was obviously more than the time his contract stipulated. And what to make matters worse, he was also abandoned in Nigeria. So he took the intervention of of certain international um, non-governmental organizations to ensure that they were repatriated and paid and sent back to Bangladesh. So these are some of the issues that seafarers need to take into account. You need to make sure you understand how many months or how many years your contract is for, so you're not... um, overworked by the ship owner. Um, also, one issue is the obligations as well and the duties. So you need to understand what your obligations are to the seafarer, to the ship owner, sorry, and um, to understand what your responsibilities are so that you don't work outside the scope of your work, for example. So if you're an engineer, for example, you need to understand what your obligations are to the ship owner on board the vessel and what your duties are. And then the last thing I'll talk about will be international law. So international law also protects um, certain rights or recognizes certain rights for for seafarers. So do you have rights under international law? The answer is yes, you have rights under international law. Um, Some of the rights you have under international law are enshrined in several human rights um, um, conventions. Um, So one of the rights which I want to talk about is repatriation, which is something that has been spoken about by Akash. Um, I think this repatriation is a very, very key issue. Like I mentioned, when you talk, when I made the ex- give an example of the Bangladeshi MC fraud that was in Nigeria for about a year, and then uh, also one aspect is the prohibition of of inhumane treatment. So this really does not have to cover issues that um, pertain to torture. For example, it could be your working condition. It could be what's the bed space on board the vessel. It could be you provided with. 
um, with um, hygienic work environment. It could be you provided with a safe working environment. It could be you provided with um, basic utensils to ensure that your stay on board the vessel will be very, very um, fruitful and one that is not plagued with, with, with challenges. Because like Akash mentioned, um, you spend hours, you spend months, you spend months really on board the vessel. So imagine being stuck in a vessel where you don't have good toilets, you don't have um, decent food, the working conditions are terrible, and you have to be there, and you have a contract which you've signed for six months. So these are certain rights that, that international law um, enshrines for, for seafarers. And then what international organizations protect seafarers? So the two, um, two major international organizations which I want to make mention of and I think they've also really collaborated as well with regards um, seafarers um, in this um, day of the seafarers is the International Legal, Legal, Labor Organization and the International Maritime Organization. Um, the International Maritime Organization specifically has done a lot of work, um, especially um, with regards to the MLC, which is the Maritime Labor Convention 2006, which many states of, of the world have now had to ratify or are sent to. And ISWAN as well. ISWAN is also a body that um, helps seafarers that are stranded in different countries. Um, and then lastly, which international conventions apply to Nigeria? So as a Nigerian seafarer, what international conventions apply to you? So the ILO and um, the IMO and the MLC, all of these conventions have been um, ratified in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, Nigeria plays a very, very important role in many of these organizations. So if there's any issue that has to do with your rights being trampled upon by your by, by, by the ship owner or your employer, please, it is very important to contact a lawyer or even before you do that, ensure that you have a lawyer look through your agreement to ensure that you don't sign what is so, something that's akin to slavery. Um, so I think these are some of the points that I which I have to share. So um, if you need these slides, um, please, my contact detail is at the last page. You can email me. You can also send me, you can call me as well. And I'll be happy to share um, an insight on some of these issues. And I can share my slides with you as well. So thank you very much for listening and Bolaji, over to you. Thank you very much, Kenneth. That was very also informative and educative. Um, I think you gave us a very clear perspective from the international and Nigerian um, angle and the laws that are available to protect seafarers. Thank you for that. Um, some questions are already rolling in. We have questions for Akash and Eleni. So I'll read them when um, I'll read them when um, Adamaka is done. That's the last speaker so that we can all treat the questions um, um, as we go. Um, but Eleni, you see your question in the chat box. But I'll read it to you um, when when we are done, if that's fine, when the last speaker is done. So we're going to have the last speaker now, which is Adamaka Okechuku. She is a second mate with Bon, bon, uh, bon, bon Inter, Inter Oil Nigeria Limited. She is um, also very experienced in the field of seafarer as she is one. And um, she is, I'm going to share the Nigerian perspective from uh, practical experiences. Um, um, what um, is obtainable for seafarers and why they should be considered key workers. So thank you very much. Um, over to you, Adamaka. Welcome. Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you're calling from. Um, thank you for this opportunity given to me to share my thoughts on the impact of the crisis on seafarers, uh, especially here in Nigeria. So um, I will be speaking on seafarers being key workers and um, the challenges they face here in Nigeria. So from my slides, um, with the help of the moderator, I will be sharing my slides with you. Um, I'll start with the introduction, which states that the shipping industry, also termed as the invisible industry by many is crucial to the existence of the global economy. Yet very few people have any idea what happens at the high seas. It is an industry which is secretive and fascinating at the same time. As, a vital, as vital as the industry is to the world, it cannot do without the great seafarers 
who perform the toughest jobs in the roughest seas and the riskiest areas. And around 90% of the world's trade is carried out by the international shipping industry. This goes to show that the shipping and indeed seafarers play a very vital role in the global economy and global supply chain. So um, what this is saying is that the world cannot do without shipping because as the world population continues to grow, particularly in developing countries, uh, low cost and efficient maritime transport has an essential role to play in growth and sustainable development. So shipping helps to ensure that uh, the benefits of trade and uh, commerce are more evenly spread. Take a look at uh, most of the essentials we use on the daily, like you know the food we eat, the clothes we wear, and um, you know most of the stuff we use are mostly brought into the country through shipping. Yeah. So with that being said, um, I'll move ahead to further talk about the impact of the present crisis on seafarers in Nigeria. So um, most of the challenges resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic and how it affects seafarers in Nigeria as follows. Uh, we'll talk about communication. We'll talk about the safety of seafarers, both on board and upon disembarkation. We'll talk about the mental health and travel restrictions. Now, you know, um, it is no news that uh, we are facing an unprecedented humanitarian and uh, safety crisis in shipping, which, if not addressed, will be an adverse, will have an adverse effect on the global economy and the global supply chain. So, you know, when it comes to communication, the seafarers at sea, they've not had that privilege of, you know, being able to be with their loved ones. Instead, they've been left with the whole, um, with the only um, choice, which is communication. And now, most of these crews are on ships where, ships that are trapped in locations where they aren't able to, you know, reach out to their families and loved ones, maybe due to network issues, I mean, lack of um, internet access, thereby making the communication um, sporadic for, you know, for them. So um, the next um, problem we have here is um, safety of seafarers on board ship and upon disembarkation. Uh, before the pandemic, thousands of seafarers traveled in and out of ports every month. Some spend weeks and even months on board the ships. You know, new crews would regularly arrive and relieve them of their duties ensuring that, you know, the vessels weren't endangered by fatigued sailors. But uh, thanks to the crisis now, you know, this critical process is breaking down and threatening the safety of the waterways. I mean, even before the pandemic, seafarer fatigue was already like, like a cause of, for alarm. Although some rules and regulations have been established to limit work hours on board. And yeah, crew changes are a crucial means of, you know, mitigating these problems. But the virus-related travel bans, combined with the, you know, the cessation of flights, have made that process very, very difficult. And uh, this brings me to the next point that talks about uh, mental health. So um, it is esteemed, estimated rather that. Um, about 150,000 seafarers are stranded on board and all over the globe. And these, in effect, are key workers who can't go home just yet. You know, they are, they are left to deal with the whole mental stress of not knowing when they will disembark or when their relievers will come on board. 
So as a result of the crewing and the mining problems here in Nigeria, seafarers battle with the stress and um, anxiety, you know, if nothing is done about it. And, you know, it can lead to hazardous consequences due to human error, which is a very, very serious issue for us. But I know seafarers are a very resilient and uh, understanding community. And amidst the whole crisis, they will still manage to not let this situation affect their work on board. So now, um, talking about the travel restrictions, um, it is quite unfortunate that not all seafarers will be able to be repatriated everywhere in the world. Um, that's why here in Nigeria, we, we will be, you know, it will be a welcome idea to see that there is an intensive collaboration between, you know, the shipping and port communities, as well as the government, to ensure that um, seafarers are exempted from travel restrictions, you know. Already, um, the maritime, the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, NIMASA, in line with the newly endorsed uh, guidelines by the IMO, was said to have um, directed companies to employ special and dedicated means of transportation for, you know, seafarers, to convey seafarers from, from ships, to and from ships, you know. And so we are looking forward to seeing that these companies comply with these guidelines. Yeah. So, um, Moving on to the next slide. Mm. Here it talks about why seafarers are key workers. Seafarers have been described to be key workers as key workers by the IMO with the following points. Here, this first one says, seafarers dedicate themselves to a life at sea, doing works that can doing work that can often be challenging, lonely, and even dangerous. Most times, um, seafarers are faced with these challenges. And, you know, say uh, we are at sea. No one knows what is going on. We are the only ones who, you know, who face all these challenges. And at times when we, when we are at sea for so long, we get lonely and... The loneliness can bring about depression, which is really not, which is really not um, something that uh, anyone would would really want to experience. But I believe seafarers should be given that priority, you know, as key workers that they are. The second point states that seafarers perform the toughest jobs in the roughest seas and in the riskiest areas. The third point says, seafarers are exposed to daily hazards in an industrial workplace. The next point states that seafarers are faced with poor mental health and stress as a result of isolation. Um, also, seafarers are at risk of piracy and kidnapping. Yeah, you know, when you're sailing and you're 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 just you're not aware you you do not, you do not know what is ahead of you you're just um you're just being careful you know hopefully hope hope hoping that um you do not end in, um, encounter any danger you know while you're on the course of sailing seafarers um are responsible for leading the global economy and the global supply chain. Like I said earlier on, um, without these ships coming in and out of the country, uh, most of the daily supplies we, 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 we use um, would not get to us. So, you know, seafarers are responsible. They are the frontliners. Without them, these ships cannot move. So I believe that they should be, you know, given that priority as key workers in the in the world. So without 
Yeah, the next slide, um, the conclusion, my conclusion to, you know, everything I've just said is that it is um, necessary for the government to realize that seafarers are a special case and they need to be relieved at the end of their contract, you know, to avoid um, humanitarian and safety crisis. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, there, Adamaka. That was very good, great and informative. Thank you for sharing the Nigerian perspective. Um, I'm sure we could see um, the similarity between the challenges faced even at the Nigerian level and at the international space. Um, um, and a very huge similarities with um, the experience Aka shared and um, that of Adamaka. Quite unfortunate that um, not to do that with people as well. That's why we're having these conversations. That's why that's why we are doing um having this um, rounding discussion so that we can begin to. Hello, can you hear me? The audio is limited. Are available. Yeah, the audio. We need to create ways and um, mediums where we can execute these laws and protect. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, just in one minute. For all the speakers um, from Eleni to Akash to Kenneth and to Adamaka, just one final word, especially considering the pandemic era. We, we don't know if things will ever be the same way with travel, with migration. We don't, we're just seeing things unveiled to us as we go. Um, what do you want to say in one word to a, probably a seafarer on this platform or people that are into protection of seafarers what advice you'd give as a take-home advice from this session? What can be done to improve this conversation, to improve the welfare of seafarers? What can we do? Just in one word, in one sentence, as your patent phrase for, for this roundtable discussion. So we'll start with Eleni, Akash, Kenneth, and then we'll have Adamaka. Just one word. What can we do starting from now? What action step as a lawyer, as a seafarer, as an IT person? What can I do to be part of the progress to help the um, conditions of seafarers right now? Thank you, Mubulaji. So from a seafarer's perspective, since it's the International Day of Seafarers, I would say be cautious of your employer. Uh, because, for instance, again, I come from a perhaps a bubble. I work for an IG club. Not every ship owner is a member of an IG club, but it's important to check online. I can send you on the chat uh, just um, a hyperlink of the PNI club uh, of the sorry IG club. Uh, and then you can just type the name of the vessel and see if it's covered by a PNI club. So I know that uh, there is a lot of uh, crisis regarding the pandemic, and perhaps there is a risk to be stranded somewhere due to the flight restrictions. And I know from experience that if if the ship owner is covered from a PNI club, they will do their best to repatriate the crew. Uh, also, if you fall sick, they will do their best to give you the medical attention that you need uh, to make sure, you know, if there is any uh, need for a ventilator, anything like that. So I would say I will send you the link now just to make sure that your ship is covered and is part of the IG. So that's a very practical, I think, advice. I know that it's not always easy to choose. Uh, but this is a good indicator that you're going to be safe in the current environment. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni. Thank you for that. Akash. Uh, I think from seafarers' perspective, uh, so there are, there are many seafarers who are trapped right now, one who are at home and the ones who are at ship. The ones at the ship want to go home because their contracts have been extended, right? And the ones who are right now just waiting to join their ship they're just waiting. My word of advice would be use your time very carefully because you won't get your time back. Because, I mean, the whole pandemic situation which has come up has been affecting many industries. It's not just a seafaring, it's all the segments which are affected. What really important is the time which you have right now. It can be a boon and a curse if you are able to use your time perfectly. I mean, if you can, you know, learn something, if you can upgrade yourself, which you didn't want to do. Try to engage because this, these are 
difficult times and there's one quote as well which i would like to quote is like you can't change the direction of the wind but you can always adjust your sails to reach your destination so try to you know help yourself guys i mean i know it's a difficult situation nobody can do it everybody is trying their level best to get it happen but yeah whatever time you have don't waste it that is my key tip for the people thank you thank, thank you. you so much arkesh thank you very much for those um thought provoking words um make use of the time now actively as you can don't waste don't waste it and um develop and improve yourself as much as you can thank you um adamaka your parting words to us okay thank you very much um well uh for sifaras uh, my advice would be that you know why you joined the profession and you know it's because of the passion you have for the job yeah nobody forced you into it so um you should also remember that um, the most important thing is safety in whatever you do always apply safe measures yes yeah, so and also in times like this try as much as possible you know to stay safe because i know that you are a resilient um, community as as a seafarer so try as much as possible to stay safe um and yeah that's all i have to say thank you thank you thank you very much thank you thought forwards there kenneth to wrap up the conversation what what yes. would be your parting words okay my parting words as a lawyer well i i will keep it very simple it is cheaper to have a lawyer when you start everything because when the problem starts it will be more expensive so make sure you start with your lawyer from the from when you begin the negotiation process because at that point it's going to be cheaper but the moment the problems begin it's become more expensive so lawyers are your friends so that's that's all i have to say thank you thank you very much it's been a pleasure hosting this um, round table conversation in the chat box we have the contact links eleni dropped um, a contact link i saw it there thank you eleni um we have from kenneth akash you probably want to drop a contact link for us to to be able to reach you adamaka in case um you want us to contact you please drop a contact link do well to utilize these opportunities and let's continue this conversation even from here um some very insightful things have been shared and i'm sure this is just the beginning and i'm hoping that we can keep making the world a better place thank you very much um all right so in the absence of everything anything being said have a beautiful day ahead thank you bye thank you very much thank you bye everyone cheers guys bye bye take care okay, bye everyone